All right, Josh, today we're talking about Star Trek TNG Season 3, Episode 8. Alex, what are you doing? I'm doing my yoga routine. What are you talking about? Why would you be doing that? What What are you talking about? I do this all the time. You've literally never done this before. Oh, what? Just because I've never done it on camera doesn't mean I don't do it every time we do this? Council of Troy meets a mysterious diplomat. When I first saw you, I felt as if I'd been waiting for you. But he's hiding special powers that could destroy critical negotiations. You're reading their emotional states and then using that to manipulate them. On Star Trek, the next generation. So The Price, definitely one of the more unique episodes, not only of the season, but of the series, I would say. Definitely the most unique and weird to the point where we're watching it. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> we're going to bid on this wormhole. We're going to have this very stable diplomatic solution. It started off kind of nice. Which I thought was a very interesting idea of like this. They found this wormhole. They're selling it. And all these different species are joined here on the Enterprise to try to buy it from them, going off of their word that it's a stable wormhole, but Data and others on the Enterprise are like, there's no really such thing as a stable wormhole. That's quite a claim, so let's test it ourselves uh, during this whole negotiation. And then bringing in the character of Rawl, Matt McCoy, who I thought was the highlight of the episode, him and Troy, uh, Marina Certez's performance here, getting what I think is the best Troy story we've gotten, a romance story with someone outside of Riker that's actually pretty fleshed out, gets multiple scenes of screen time of just them two. Um, really enjoyed that. It's definitely weird out there. The editing is very odd. There's a lot of weird choices there. Uh, but, you know, I prefer like a different episode that's unique and something I haven't seen to something we've seen a million times, which honestly so far in TNG, there isn't really anything we've seen a million times. No. Uh, yeah, definitely the most unique. Very odd with its editing. I don't know. I would love to see what was left on the cutting room floor as compared to what's made it, especially with like, oh, sometimes editing is good with like showing like a passage of time. With like or like, okay, these characters are doing this. Let's jump back to these characters. But no, there was like three or four times where it's a scene with Raoul in the negotiation room, and then it cuts to Raoul and Troy. I'm like, what did like, like oh recess? Gotta go get naked. You know, that was really odd. And to the point where like I think like three quarters of the episode, it cut back to uh, Worf and Picard on the bridge. I was like, oh yeah. These characters exist too, because there was it was just so much of just like Troy, Riker, and uh, Ral. It was really odd. Um, back to the wormhole. I, I guess it, it was only stable because it it appears every two hundred and thirty three minutes. Like that was like its only confirmed fact stable part. It's like okay. I guess it's worth testing because they know it always reappears at that time. It is a scary thing to deal with. Like, oh, just this wormhole, we just got to go test. I mean, look what ends up happening to the Ferengi. They're just stranded 7,000 light years away, and they make a comment that it'll take 80 years to get to them. So they're dead, basically. I mean, they're all... Unless they find, like, a planet or a civilization. I'm sure they'll be fine. But their own stupidity did that to them. Yeah. It's like, I think our crew would have been fine. And they, they were fine because they figured out, like, oh, we have to jump back through this point here. Uh, we're not working with you, Federation. We shouldn't even be talking to you, even though we're working together. And, like, even Jordy says, idiots. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, Matt McCoy as Patrick Bateman, uh, Ralph, <laughs> definitely one of the best guest characters that, you know, I think the best villain or the best any controvert, yeah, villain for the most part, but any side character is where, where you're like, I fucking hate this guy. But then he drops a line like, that's a good point. <laughs> Do you tell the Romulan that's about to attack that you sense that he may be bluffing? Or do you just tell it to your captain? Yeah, absolutely. And it's great when the person you're supposed to be rooting against also makes good points. So it's not just so black and white, you know, over the top, mm -hmm. you know, villain. And I really enjoyed that. Uh, again, Marita Sirtis, great performance here. Especially that ending scene was a great ending scene where she rejects him, basically. I need you. I already have a job as counselor. He walks away. She stays looking forward. Eyes start to water. End of episode, End great of ending, uh, and great stuff from her. And yeah, all of the romantic scenes with them, I felt were w well done. They weren't like over the top. There was like a weird shot where it was just Troy's foot for 10 seconds. Yeah, you got the timestamp on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were just like uh, some weird shots throughout the episode. But those scenes in particular, I thought they were well done. It was interesting. I was, I was very interested to see where it would go. I'm not going to say I was bought in that they were going to have her leave with him. But, you know, the way the show is set up, you know, it's kind of like... 
you know, it makes the relationship while it's happening more believable. You know, I kind of believe it a little bit more. They put more into it than just a random hookup scene. So I really enjoyed it. Um, beyond that, though, definitely my most appreciated thing of it is just the practical costumes for all the aliens. And actually, a good performance, a good appearance from the Ferengi. <laughs> They started off at such a low point in TNG that to see where they've come in such a short amount of episodes for them is very jarring. Like, they're a welcome addition now to an episode for me. I get excited to see them now. Yeah. I was like, oh, what, the Ferengi? Ooh, what are these little bastards going to get up to? And they're, not, <laughs> and they're not that malicious either. They didn't kill that guy with the mustache. They didn't kill him. It's like, oh, they just put him out for a bit so he wasn't in part of the negotiations. I'm like, okay. That's nice, and I like how they cut a deal with this Ral guy to get, get, get control of this wormhole. It's just weird that, like, I guess, like, the Chrysalian, Ral is a Chrysalian, is, is yeah. what I believe they're called. Like, they're not, uh, they're not warmongers or anything, so they just want it for convenience of travel, I guess. Like, is that worth going through all the effort just to travel through this wormhole? I mean, that's his job. So, I mean, the way I saw it was just, like, Everything else that happens while he's there just, like, happened to be, you know, the stuff with Troy and everything he didn't expect. I think he genuinely liked Troy and was attracted to her and, you know, would have, you know, been with her at the end. As Riker says, he's like, you know, she would make your life meaningful. I don't think you're smart enough to do it. I think he kind of took Riker's words to heart and it was part of his reflection after all that. And he realized Troy would be a good part of his life. So I believed that genuineness of him. But his job was just sent there by the Chrys Chrysalians to just be like, hey, I'm supposed to buy this wormhole. Like that's that was his job. So basically, yeah, he just caught feelings, bro. I mean, he didn't Maybe. do anything nefarious like the Ferengi poisoning people and, you know, all that. Like, he, he set up the fake scenario with the Ferengi, but it's not like he was doing anything that, that would get him, like, arrested or, you know, anything like that. No, no, he just gaslit the uh, the tall <laughs> bastard. Thing. Yeah. It was basically a poker game. This whole episode yeah. was a poker game. And you know who's going to win a poker? Riker. Oh, yeah. with that great scene. You must play poker, Commander. Poker. Is that a game of some sort? It's like, don't bullshit me. <laughs> yeah, that was that was great. And that scene in Ten Forward where like Riker completely completely dismantles Raoul. It's like, don't play this game with Riker. Like I know, he I know all about this. Yeah, and it's so great because as you said, that whole episode up to this point, all we see from Raoul is confidence, and he's successful in every manipulation, every scene. And even in that scene with Riker, he has the upper hand that whole way. But then when he turn, he, he goes too far, and he brings up Deanna, thinking that will get to Riker the most. And I'm going to take her too. It's the first bad play I've seen you make. By the time Riker's done with his speech, you, now you see the uncertainty in Ral. Oh, the first time we see his face break that shitty smirk, and it's like, oh, fuck, he got him. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, it does really make me question, like... Are Riker and Deanna just kind of done? Like they, like, they talk about it like, oh, yeah, we're just good friends, and Riker's like, hey, if you can make her happy, whatever. Like, it really seems like the relationship is just a thing that happened before the show, and now it's just like they don't really care. It's like, I feel like they have a deep appreciation for each other, but it's yeah. like they know it's not working out right now. We don't even get that much, though. Like, we don't even get an acknowledgement of, like, it wouldn't work out. They just don't really talk to each other. <laughs> I'm sure they're going to... I have faith in the show that at some point they're going to bring this up. I have faith in the show that they're going to address this. Like, I know, like, we've broken apart these past few whatever. Past few seasons. Past few seasons. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Got to bring it up. Uh, the the yoga scene. Got to bring it up. I'm uh, not talking about it. You can say we. <laughs> oh, I have so much to say about it. I, it's believable. I, I, oh, yeah, I mean, it's a, f a perfectly normal thing. Yeah, the do yoga all the time uh it's just was like out of just, nowhere it's just i wouldn't have put the mirrors in there like i don't know who's in charge but people work out in front of mirrors but in terms of what we're seeing it's like okay you know i i see what you're doing here it's like take it easy are women not allowed to exercise because of because of men looking at it no but it's, <laughs> the mirrors were put there i feel like for a certain reason and I feel, this feels very Gene Roddenberry's rock walking around in bikinis. It's like, like, I don't know. It's like, oh, she's stretching this way. Put a mirror there so we can see her ass. You know what I mean? It's like, look, man, I'm not talking about it. <laughs> You're married. I'm not. Right? <laughs> but there's nothing rational about this. Who needs rational when your toes curl up? What I liked about that scene was uh, a little more into Beverly. It's like, oh. Oh, did you fall in love with Jack? Yeah, it's like, oh no, it was someone else. Yeah, that was a nice little story. It, that was done in a week. It took months to figure it out with Jack. I'm like, oh, but that was it's a neat little scene. Yeah, it does play a little bit into the cliche of like, 
all these two female characters get to have a scene together and what are they doing talking about men. But that's not, you know, always a bad thing. I mean, when guys are together, they talk about women. When women are together, they talk about men. I think it's a normal thing. Would I love to see scenes of them together where they're not talking about men? Yes. You know, yes, but exactly. for the story in this episode, I think it made sense. And like Dr. Beverly, it, uh, oh, it's been a while since I called her that. Really only other female at this point on the cast. So it makes sense uh, as to the actual activities of the scene. I'll, I'll Leave that alone. I'm interested in what they have to say about it. it it's just like, if that was by itself, but the, like the other scene with like the foot massage, it's like... Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going someone on. Someone is, you know, putting their stuff out there. It's like... Robert Shearer is the, rec the director, and I wanted to look it up because the writer had a similar last name, if not the same. Let me see. Oh, okay. So they had very similar last names, but spelled differently. So it must just be a coincidence. <laughs> it's also Shearer, but a different spelling. <laughs> yeah, Robert Shearer, Hannah Louise Shearer, but spelled differently. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's hilarious. That's great. Do you think Raoul was actually hurt? Because he, when he walked off, he looked a little bit straight-faced. Like, I feel like everything he says is a manipulation in some way. Yeah, I think it's definitely a cool thing to leave it up to the audience of how much do you believe in Raoul. Like, I want to believe his genuineness at the end. But you didn't. You immediately called it out as like he was manipulating her still. So I think leaving it open like that and him just walking out, not even looking at the camera and then episode ends, I think that's a good way to leave it. Because who's important here? It's Troy at the end of the day. That's the important character. Mm -hmm. You know, ended on her. What you think of Rel, I think, is up to the audience member. And I really like that. Yeah, let it be a mystery. Like, I like that. These are the patron takes for the price. I read this because of based in Chad. Because uh... just put in any brain rot terms. <laughs> we'll, we'll, read, we'll read your take. Just capitalize any brain rot terms. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna look for it and read it. And you thought the douchebag from episode one was the worst. He was. Doctor Stubbs was far worse <laughs> than this guy. But I loved to hate him. See, this is the difference for me. Doctor Stubbs was just like I didn't feel like he even belonged in the show. Like in this universe, he was just like out of place. As to where this guy, I thought played his role perfectly, and I loved to hate him. He's such a hateable guy, but also made good points. I thought Dr. Stubbs, you know, thought he was on the wrong show or something. So people were, you know, commenting, because that episode has gone up now, like, oh, actually, the actor did a really good job because you hated him. It's like, no, I'm not fucking stupid. I understand that I'm not supposed to like him. <laughs> I didn't enjoy the performance. Like, it's a, a little bit deeper than that. It's like that uh, famous wrestling sign. I'm not booing you because of your good heel work. I'm booing you because I genuinely do not like you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's go away heat. It's Go away, sure. X-Pac heat. Has your opinion of the Ferengi changed or perhaps become more nuanced since we first saw them in early season one? Alex and Josh, the fans, they now stand. I'm doing my yoga routine.